parents. The child is, goes to the teacher who will guide them. Mean by external moral authority. You use that expression a lot. Materialism has to do with when you are. Hello. This is the course in values and spirituality. We are currently at unit two, which is page 63 onwards of book number one. Sister Denise is with me in the studio today, and we will be going through the various aspects that this segment covers, including the findings of the commissions and committees, as well as corruption and illegal practices. Sister Denise, welcome back. Thank you. I would like to start with um, something that is contained on page 65, which reads as follows. The erosion of values in present day society is a matter of great concern for educationalists. Since independence, various commissions and committees have been set up by the government of India and other bodies to suggest reforms in the field of education. They emphasize the necessity for education in values in order to inculcate universal and human values like truth, peace, love, justice, and cooperation. I'm quite curious, Sister Denise, what has been the findings of these commissions of inquiry? There is a phenomenon in India which is really different from what we're used to in the West. Because India is so vast and so varied, on the one hand, there's an awareness of the greatness of India, all of the specialities of India, the beauty and the wonder of India. And then on the other hand, there's an awareness of this dark underbelly of corruption and violence and so on. And it's been impossible to reconcile these two. So people have to sort of jump between the one and the other. And there seems to be no kind of um, smooth way to get between the two. So it's a jerk, you know. The commissions found that um, the problem is one of values. And uh, values, the list here, truth, peace, love, justice, cooperation. When you have um, historically a society, Hindu society, which has been under domination of another culture and another uh, religion, so it was under Islamic domination for 700 years, it was under um, British, French, Portuguese, German, for a couple of hundred years. It puts the people in a state of survival. And when people are in a state of survival, they have to resort to methods of operating which are totally against their principles, their ideals, and um, what you do when you're a free person. And this has created this extraordinary set of double standards. And India, after independence, has been really struggling with that. India was very much a place that thought of itself in terms of regions. After independence, there had to be the development of um, a sense of national unity, but there hadn't been national unity before that. And so it had to be created. Uh, the development of Hindi language was imposed as being more important than regional languages, which made difficulties for people. The values that are being talked about in the Constitution are based on more liberal, democratic, uh, ideals, but the culture of India is based on something very different, um, with very different um, values. And so you have an inbuilt clash of values, 
And the people of India, I think, have, have had a hard time trying to figure out which side of the fence to go on, which side of the fence is the better side of the fence. And many people went with the traditions. And the traditions actually go against the laws. Um, what made them choose the traditions over what else was available? Well, the traditions are what you know. And the laws were something that was kind of imposed from the outside, so it resembled uh, the imposition of uh, colonial power. And so it was not um, natural to choose that. The people who set it up were the Western educated intellectuals, which is not the majority of the country. And so you have um, demographic groups in India which really don't gel with each other. You have the caste system which um, goes back many millennia and in the vision of Gandhi, who the father of the na nation, uh, he, he wanted to get rid of that. And so when you want to get rid of something very ancient, after an interlude of colonization, uh, and, and then you bring in something which is a set of ideals, a, a utopia, um, when it comes down to the practical realities, there's all kinds of unforeseen problems. And so it created a sort of chaos, um, artificially induced conflicts between social attitudes and the legal system, resulting in a very cumbersome situation. Um, and we're still dealing with that uh, now. Um, in 2016-17 is very different even from 20 years ago when we started talking about all this. You go on to mention the Dolores Report, a report that was um, requested by UNESCO, which is the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. This organization set up an international commission under the chairmanship of Jacques Delors. It included educators from around the world the Dolores Report identified four pillars of education, learning to know, learning to do, learning to be, and learning to live together. The first requires intellectual ability, that is learning to know. Learning to do requires an acquisition of skills. Learning to be and learning to live together require inculcation of values. Um, when I read this, what struck me is that there are very few people who have heard of the Dolores Report. Well, that's very true. Um, but I think that people have been grappling with this aspect, which is really missing from the education systems in most cases, especially the state education systems, which um, want to prepare the young generation to fit and comply with the world that they will grow up into. Um, but learning to be and learning to live together, um, that you don't find very much in the education system. It's nice if it can be there, but um, so far it's too much work, too expensive, and you just do not have the quality of teachers and the amount of money assigned to education is extremely limited. So again, what we see with this um, commission is the government would like all this, but then when it comes to actually doing it, they're constrained by lack of funds and pretty much lack of political will, because all the attention goes on what the adults want, which is comfort, money, security, things like that. And in a sense, the children are a secondary consideration. And so they get the, um, the leftovers, as it were. 
Uh, let us now move on to uh, 2.3.2 on page 65, which covers the subjects of corruption and illegal practices. Corruption, bribery and nepotism are prevalent in India at various levels, despite laws against them. Corruption means to use or be willing to use political or social power to perform dishonest or illegal actions in return for money or some advantage. This is something that has to be addressed, isn't it? Well, no, the thing is it's not quite as simple as that because, you see, if you look at it from the angle of the law, which um, is based on principles that are sort of household ways of thinking about it in one culture, Western culture, uh, it doesn't fit on the existing system of India, you see, because in India, um, everything is done on the basis of relationships, on the base, uh, and nepotism in India um, up until that time is the right way to do things, you see, because you can trust your relatives. Um, but you see, when you mix these two very different cultural oceans, um, you find that one of them is going to call itself right on the basis of certain criteria and the other one wrong. Then the other one, the ancient one, will say, well, it may not be right, but this is how we do things. So you see there's this split and it's very difficult to reconcile it. You see, in India, gifts, bringing gifts is how you get things done and how you show respect. So here you have a situation where respect becomes a crime and they're not going to buy that. There are many instances someone wants to put up a building they have to get permission from the municipality so they will create a relationship and then they will use corruption in order to get the permission because the bottom line in all cases is I need, I want more money than my salary permits. And so corruption um, is the only way anything goes. It gives a lot of opportunity for criminal gangs to come in, for mafias to operate very well, and it is a very big issue, but very difficult to address directly because of the archaic social attitudes that say, this is how you do things. And there's an assumption that a person is self-monitoring, a person is honorable, so that what they want, their selfish desires, is the same thing as what's good. Uh, people will feel that accumulating large amounts of money is good. How you do it doesn't matter. And so who gets um, damaged in the process too bad because I need to look good, I need to advance. And um, because it's kind of embedded in with the archaic social values, the sense of um, social justice that may be there in another culture that, well, if I do this, it's going to cause a lot of damage to other people. That sense is not there. And then if you look at the um, world over, uh, people are going to say, okay, to the Western world, you bring in your liberal human rights principles, but look at how you behaved as a colonial power. It's totally the opposite of your liberal principles. And so what they just see is absolute hypocrisy. And so you have um, selfishness versus hypocrisy. 
who says which one is better. And basically, I think people do the one that they're best at, they're most adept at. Mm. And it's a very difficult situation that I don't think um, education is going to help with. I really enjoyed the quote that you have at the bottom of page 65 by um, Justice M. N. Venkatacharya, the chairman of the National Human Rights Commission in 1997. And he said, I quote, people think that corruption can solve their problems and fulfill their yearning for survival, but they will soon find that this is a mirage. Meanwhile, the damage done to society is immense. These are very powerful words. Yes. Mm. Um, what I found interesting, Sister Denise, is the next line um, written by yourself reads, greed is at the root of this attitude. I wouldn't have thought so. I thought dishonesty was at the root of this attitude. Tell me how you arrived at the conclusion that greed is the root? Well, greed is another word for I want this. If I do this, this and this, honest or dishonest, then I can get it. So I would put dishonesty as the um, the instrument of greed rather than and, and I would still keep greed at the source you see self-restraint uh, denying yourself what you could get if you did all sorts of things um, presupposes a, a, a sense of inner honor that says um, I can enrich myself uh, provided it also enriches everybody else. But if I enrich myself at the expense of other people and bring in the law of karma to that, it means I'm going to have to pay sooner or later that which is the gap. When you, um, when you can get away with stuff, you don't give importance to accountability. And so Justice Venkatacharya is saying, you know, the human rights problem of in India is because people care about themselves, not about anybody else. There's another strand in India, which is also, I think, important to factor in, and that is the strand of charity. So you get people who will make a huge amount of money through their business practices which are illegal or legal, honest or dishonest, and which cause a lot of social damage. And then they will um, do some charitable action for the benefit of the people who had been exploited. And then that sort of cancels out the sin. This is how they do this. Okay. That's um, curious. Well, it's curious, but it corresponds to the archaic social system, uh, but it doesn't fit with the more um, democratic human rights, ba human rights based system that was brought into India and which India doesn't recognize unless it's Western educated. Now in the world today, you have a vast number of well educated people in India who don't belong to the archaic social attitudes, but they belong to a much more internationally minded set of people. So you have this new energy coming in, which says uh, there shouldn't be garbage all over the place. We don't go with that. Um, which says everything has to be according to the rules. So there's a, a differently sensitized large demographic group which is changing the landscape and that has occurred I think very much after all of this which was done in the um, uh, this this quote came from 1997 you see so in the 20 years that have ensued India has become quite a different place mm. Mm. Uh, the next uh, part that caught my attention was the following. Corruption, the use of violence, unfair and illegal practices are also widely used to influence the result of elections and undermine the democratic process. 
What I find curious is what you said two lines later, when corruption is operating at all levels of the state and in business, education, administration and the media, it cannot be controlled by law enforcement. That was an eye-opener. Well, this is something that I found when I was um, interacting with um, some of the big institutions, uh, educational institutions in India, that there were many that were totally wedded to the principle of corruption, and they operate like that, and they manage it very fine. Um, it is true that corruption is all over, uh, and it's also true that there are many people who decided unilaterally to operate without corruption. I interacted with many um, educational institutions that were not corrupt, and they seemed to be able to coexist side by side, but in such vast quantities that, yes, you know, law enforcement can manage when there's a deviation, but when it becomes such a great stream within a society that you change by changing social attitudes. And changing social attitudes takes actually several generations. It takes political will more than anything, and it takes people coming into positions of power to demonstrate that over a long period of time. Uh, what do you mean by political will? Political will means that people in power will demonstrate that. Mm. Um, but when people in power do what they do and get into power through the means of corruption, well, the leopard doesn't change his spots. Mm. You end off on an um, optimistic note. Uh, it, meaning corruption, can only be prevented by voluntary self-restraint together with inspiring leadership. Do you think that this will happen in our lifetime? Uh, I think that we, we are seeing evidence of it. There are a lot of people in India who are inspired by high ideals a lot. And it's a very powerful stream. India is no longer poor like it was. When I w first came to India in the 1970s, uh, the poverty of India was very, very evident and um, very shocking. There wasn't really a middle class. Um, in the ensuing 40 years, a middle class has developed and a wealthy class has developed because business has really done well and a few uh, individuals have done extremely well. And uh, India has learned to um, expect higher living standards. But what you also see at the same time is a huge gap between the wealthy and the poor, so that the um, wealth of India has gone to a certain section, which is the educated section, and um, then there's a vast quantity of people who are not experiencing any benefit from this additional wealth. Um, but when you have people who are operating by um, the inspiration to serve the country, to be examples and so on, and who can afford to do that, then you have that stream which does have an influence. Voluntary self-restraint and inspiring leadership is powerful, and I think that there are some individuals who exhibit that. Uh, there are many, many energies which are in opposition to each other. So, you know, it's, it's not going to be resolved just like that. Thank you, Sister Denise, for sharing. Thank you.
Um, I would invite you to do a commission of inquiry for yourself and ask yourself where you stand as far as your own value system is concerned and also as far as corruption is concerned. It is not easy to do a self-reflection exercise. It's also not easy to admit to one's weaknesses. And it takes honesty, it takes courage to say, this is my weakness and this is how I'd like to improve. The entire point of this course in values and spirituality is to look at ways and means in which we can ameliorate the quality of our lives. So I invite you to take whatever tools you find in this course to do just that. I thank Sister Denise on your behalf for being with us in the studio today and I thank you for your time. Take care and goodbye.